thank you all for being here. I hope that those of you who have been with us all day for the conference are um, are refreshed and energized by dinner and ready for um, for our final plenary session of the day. For those of you who are joining us just for um, the lecture, um, welcome. Thank you for coming and uh, welcome to this gathering of the International Thomas Merton Society. Um, as I've done previously, uh, this is an opportunity for housekeeping announcements or program announcements, but I have none. So I won't uh, won't spend any of your time on that. Instead, I will do what I've... There we go. Thank you. Uh, I'll take a pause any way I can get it. That's fine. Uh, instead, I will introduce another of our Daggy Youth Scholars. For those um, who may be wondering, at, at the beginning of our conference, um, Bobby Nichols, one of the co-chairs of the Daggy Scholarship Committee introduced the Daggy Scholarship saying this is a, a, um, a program that provides support for young adults to attend ITMS meetings um, to encourage enthusiasm about Merton among uh, a new generation of people. I was a Daggy scholar in 2005 um, and it's, uh, it's paid off for me certainly. It's been a good, uh, it, it's been a good, a good thing from my vantage. Um, um, the Daggy Scholarship is named after Robert Daggy, who was the director of the Thomas Merton Center, um, the archives at Bellarmine University, and um, a, a towering figure in the ITMS, um, unfortunately um, uh, passed away before many of us who are now active in the society were able to get to know him, and that, that includes myself. But his legacy um, is strong and continues in the Daggy Scholarship Program. And so um, we continue the, the practice of introducing you to some of this year's Daggy Scholars as a way to uh, showcase the exciting people who are brought into the fold of the ITMS by this program. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you right now, Harley Matthews. I am Harley Matthews. I am a student at Louisville Presbyterian Seminary. Uh, to make that uh, even more uh, interesting, I'm a Methodist student at a Presbyterian seminary studying Thomas Merton. Uh, <laughs> um, that, that studying includes, and I would be remiss to not uh, initially mention my wife, Amanda, who has been patient, kind, and creative as my book collection increases all the time. Um, and I wanted to share just the, the, the importance of um, my presence here, but all of my peers that are da current Daggies, um, this has been momentous, um, a fulfilled moment um, in ways that I expected and in ways that I haven't even realized. Um, I look at Merton in three ways, and I just want to, I put a little watch timer on because they said a couple minutes. So um, specifically in the way of scholarship, I'm interested in the intersections of Thomas Merton and the life and work of John Wesley, um, of Methodism. I think that can, one, there's a lot of parallels there, um, as well as it can encourage the important moment the United Methodist Church is in, and growing in its inclusion, and growing in its interfaith work, and growing in its inner life. Um, also, I'm interested in a non-scholarly way in the tangential experiences I've found in Merton. Um, I find him in weird places. Um, that's not surprising in this room. Some of those places are places like um, the outlaw country musician Tyler Childers' most recent album um, has a quote from Thomas Merton, the last statement he made publicly before his, his death. Um, the hardcore band from uh, Richmond, Virginia, uh, Contact, um, opens two different songs with Merton uh, quotes. Um, I've watched Merton show up in spaces and places that are um, bars and clubs and tattoo shops, and I'm encouraged by that. The last space that I want to share that Merton has shown up as is, is a companion in my grief. Many of us know what that's like. I'm still recovering from the session earlier today. Um, um, Bo both of my parents passed within six months of one another. And I, it's funny what you carry with you when you get the call. And I carried Buddhist ro rosary beads and the Thomas Merton reader. And Merton sat with me as my parents transitioned into that which is love. And while that is not a single moment, um, I feel that same sense here 
as I look at all of you and I meet people that I've been reading for 15 years in the flesh. And I'm thankful for you. And so thank you for letting me be a Daggy scholar. Thank you for having me. Um, and uh, I hope to uh, honor you all well. I will end with the prayer that I prayed with both of my parents, and that is um, the promise that all is grace, and it's all grace all the way. Amen. If you're looking for a better advertisement for the Daggy Scholarship than that, I don't think you're going to find it. That's wonderful. Thank you, Harley. I have the pleasure of introducing our next plenary speaker. And this is one that I, uh, as chair of the program committee, took the prerogative to make sure I got to introduce. Sister Simone Campbell is, um, is someone I'm very excited to have join us here. I'm sure for many of you, Sister Simone needs no introduction. You'll know her well or, or be familiar with her. Sister Simone Campbell is a Roman Catholic sister of social service. She's a religious leader, an attorney, an author, She's practiced law over her career. For 17 years, she served as excuse me, executive director of Network, the Roman Catholic Social Justice Lobby. She is the author of two books, A Nun on the Bus, reflecting her experiences as the leader of the Nuns on the Bus campaign. She's an author of the book, Hunger for Hope. She's a recipient of the 2022, oh my goodness, excuse me, it's just too exciting. 2022 Presidential Medal of Freedom. You don't get to say that very often about someone. The list of accolades and accomplishments I could read goes on, but I'll deviate from that approach to the introduction to say that I have a, a special fondness for Simone because she played an important part in my life. From 2009 to 2011, I worked for Network. Um, I was able uh, to participate in both the organizing and field outreach and lobbying and advocacy components of that organization's work. And uh, it was an exciting time to be there. We were just reminiscing a bit about the, the things that were going on, the coworkers we had. It was an important time for me also because um, I had prior to then been quite interested in the intersection of faith and justice, faith and public policy. But I think like, like many people, I kind of had a view of politics and of the political process as something beneath the dignity of people of faith and conscience. Maybe I was right back then. Maybe that was the, the correct view. But one of the, one of the things that I took away from my experience at Network was an appreciation for the work of people who bring values and conscientious commitments to that sausage making process, who do the hard work of dialogue, disagreement, reconciliation, compromise, forming consensus. And Sister Simone is an expert at those things and also a model of how to bring the integrity of conscience and faith into that space. I'll share one brief anecdote, um, which uh, came to me earlier this evening when I um, was reflecting on, on our time together at Network and I had been reminding myself that I needed to find a moment to go change my clothes to put on something a little nicer than this shabby polo shirt I've been wearing all day. Um, wearing shabby polo shirts is kind of a hallmark of my life that's gone on for quite some time. And I was reminded of a time when Sister Simone scolded me for wearing a shabby polo shirt in the US Capitol. It, it would be no surprise, um, no shock to, to to people who know me, my wife would believe this entirely, that it may have been this very polo shirt that I was scolded for wearing. So clearly Simone's imprint on my life is incomplete. I still have lessons to learn, but, um, but the mark is deep and it has been, uh, has been important for me and I'm very grateful for it. I'm very grateful also that she is here and excited for us to share some time with her. So please join me in welcoming Sister Simone Campbell. I think that is the same polo shirt. But as you say that, David, one of the things that I realized ab about why to dress at the Capitol is because the folks we advocate for deserve the same quality of respect from members of Congress as everybody else. 
And you might find this surprising, but in DC, looks are really important. So it's the challenge of being true, of leveraging every possible ounce of power you can scrape together for otherwise very unpleasant topics. So that's why it was important. Well, I am just really excited to be here and to have a chance to talk about the impact of a contemplative life. And I've spent this year kind of dabbling occasionally in Merton. It wasn't a big reading of mine. When I was a young sister, I, I did, you know, conjectures of a guilty bystander and a bunch of the more activist kinds of things that he wrote. But I, I have not been, uh, I had not done a deep dive. Well, I still haven't done a deep dive, but swimming in the shallow end of uh, Merton, I, I was reading the book Silent Lamp, the biography. Some of you may know it. It's a, it's a wonderful reflection of the history of his life, which helped me understand some of his writing. But what I realized was, as the author of Silent Lamp noted, is he really couldn't talk about the details of his contemplative practice. He talked about the results, what happened, his insights, but not the the way he talked about kind of a um, the vision of what he he saw the consequences not visions like you know visions visions but the consequences the impact so I I wanted to start this by kind of a asking this brave question how many of you have some quality of a contemplative practice could I you could just raise your hands. Oh, phew. thanks be to God. Okay. Okay. Because most of this talk is a result of my own contemplative practice. So may or may not make a lot of sense if people don't know what it means, that place of ambiguity, uncertainty, and was that really prayer? What did happen? So if you can share that uh, puzzlement with me at times, it may make more sense. But I wanted to start with a story that I heard from a woman, Scylla Elworthy, who I, I love saying this, I met in Rome, actually. Um, the Voices of Faith is an organization of women, or international organization of women trying to make an impact in the Vatican, trying to change the role of women in the Vatican, and actually has had uh, has advocated for more positions for women in uh, jobs that don't need to be filled by clerics and has had an impact. So uh, I was there for one of their conferences. I was a speaker and the one of the other speakers was from England and Scylla had been a on the team of the uh, nuclear uh, the negotiators of the nuclear uh, proliferation treaties. And uh, she, when the sessions were in England, she decided that they needed some extra help. Now she's a Quaker. So she got her Quakers together, her, those who were in this meditation group with her, and they were meditating in the room below where the dialogue, the negotiations were taking place. And after a day, I believe it went on for three days. And on the second day, the Russians, uh, one of the Russian representatives says, what is happening? What is going on? And, you know, they kind of looked at each other. What do you mean? What is going on? There is something happening. And she was like, oh, dear. So she uh, said, well, there are some people that are meditating for us downstairs. I don't believe it. And so she took the Russian delegation down to meet the meditators, the folks down who were doing silent meditation in their own contemplative way below the, the conference room. And the Russian guy walks in and says, what are you doing? And he was like, meditating? <laughs> 
But what that was, and then he shook his head. He just couldn't, couldn't take it. And he goes back upstairs. It was nothing. It was nothing. But he obviously had been impacted by it. And what I think I have learned in my own practice is that the contemplative has impacts that we rarely, that occasionally we can recognize. And sometimes we even see in the moment. But the value of opening ourselves up to the reality bigger than ourselves is desperately needed in our world today. And that in a time of great division, great anger, great hostility, I believe we have a responsibility to our world to be men and women, children of a contemplative practice, of a reflection practice, of willingness to open beyond ourselves and take in the other, to be people of compassion. So I take Scylla's experience with the Russian guy who didn't quite believe it as being evidence of an impact that we can have in ways that we don't even know. Because we know in our world today, you probably picked up on this, there's a fair amount of anger, suspicion, fear, division. Um, it's not a pretty picture. I heard yesterday, or day before yesterday, about um, a horrible circumstance in El Paso where a woman was riding in an Uber car in El Paso, sees a sign, you know, El Paso's right on the Mexican border. So there's you know, a lot of signs pointing to Mexico and, and vice versa on the other side um, in Juarez sees a sign that says Mexico with an arrow that seemed to be in the direction they were going, becomes afraid that she is being kidnapped by the Uber driver. She takes out her gun and shoots him and kills him in order to protect herself. That is the level of fear can you imagine? Pope Francis in Fratelli Tutti, I love saying that, it's so much fun. <laughs> it's sort of like ice cream, but it's good. Um, says solidarity means so much more than engaging in sporadic acts of generosity. It means thinking and acting in terms of community. It means that the lives of all are prior to the appropriation of goods by a few. Let me say it again. It means that the lives of all are prior to the appropriation of goods by the few. It is this solidarity that I believe, in my experience, is a fruit of a contemplative practice. Because, at least in my experience, it is the letting down of my boundaries, my walls, my protections, to be open to those who I may not ordinarily let in. <laughs> now, ordinarily, I would let in that Uber driver, or I would let in a person living in economic struggles or a victim of domestic violence, I'll let those people in. But it also means letting in the woman who had the gun with some quality of compassion. It also means letting in these legislature, legislators that are, in my humble opinion, nuttier than fruitcakes, and trying to find a way to bring compassion to even them. It reminds me, uh, I have all these odd stories, but it reminds me after the, some of you know about our nuns on the bus and after the first bus trip, which was all about going after Paul Ryan's budget, that it failed a basic moral test 
which half the fun was saying that was because the bishop's office had said that's what had happened. So I was standing with our bishops. It was wonderful. But they had issued that press release on a Friday afternoon, hoping nobody noticed, but we noticed. So we handed it out at every possible moment. But the, the, in the bus trip, uh, Paul Ryan's office reached out and said he'd like to meet with sister. Well, I didn't trust him. I thought he was going to, so I never talked about it on the trip. We get back and staff says, all right, you'll meet with sister on July, July something, I forget, and um, come alone at noon. Don't bring the press. And it was like, it was going to be the shootout at the OK Corral or something, you know? So my, my contemplative practice had brought me to this um, realization of the challenge of radical acceptance, radical acceptance of even those I wanted to vote off the island, radical acceptance of Paul Ryan, that I needed to bring a compassionate heart to him. And so <laughs> it's high noon and we have our meeting and he's trying to impress me with his knowledge of the budget. And I was just pointing out a few little details and um, bringing up stories because that, that's the counter. He's got all this analytical data, but what about Jimmy and his family who we met in, um, oh shoot, in Milwaukee at the dining room. Oh, now I, I blocked on the name, but anyway, it was the dining room. He knew it was free, free meal, Jimmy and his wife and two kids. And, and I was telling him about how they had to go to the dining room every night for dinner. So his teenager, 14 year old and the seven year old would get enough to eat. And uh, <laughs> so I was saying your, your policy on, you know, food stamps, the supplemental nutrition assistance program is really a problem because they're going to be adversely impacted. And he says to me, well, they're not the targets of my program. And I go, no but they're going to be your victims. There's got to be a better way as opposed to, you know, that more adversarial approach. Then he shifts the conversation and he said, well, you know, I, I keep my family in Janesville as if they were in a box, but he keeps his family in Janesville and he sleeps on a cot in his office. This was supposed to be credit to him. And I said, oh, holding compassion is that good for you or your family? How do you ever get a break? It was so interesting. He could not deal with the compassion. And I realized how defended you have to be in those positions to not be able to respond with that human, the human connection. And how important it is that some of us constituents connect with that human spiritual care for the person beyond the policy. Didn't change my advocacy with him. But do you know what happened? A couple of, oh, it was about a year later, I was testifying. I was the Democratic witness, one Democratic witness, three Republican witnesses. It was so much fun. And uh, anyway, so do you know Marsha Blackburn, anybody from Tennessee? Anybody know? Okay. So She's in the Senate now. It's a little shocking, but um, she she was really upset with the sister because the sister had been censured by the Vatican, so they couldn't believe a thing I was saying. <laughs> but here's the beauty. Here's compassion paying paying off if you if you need a payoff for compassion. Paul Ryan sitting up in the the chairs raised uh, really high in the budget um, hearing room. So he's up three levels and, and he leans back and he says, oh no, sisters well within the teaching of our faith. We have a large tent. You can believe what she says. 
we had the Republican chair validating the Democratic witness. But I do believe, I do believe it was because of storytelling, but it was also because of compassion. And how do we as practitioners of a contemplative practice that some days just feels like crazy. I mean, that's distraction. How many more minutes do I have? That challenge gives a willingness to walk in other ways, to enter in new ways into relationship that's critically important. And it's that solidarity that leads us to see some new ideas, new ways of moving forward. And I believe our world is hungry for a new way forward. And we have a responsibility. This practice is not for ourselves. It's for the sake of the entire body, the entire earth, the entire element of creation. It's way bigger than any one of us. It's weird, but it's way bigger than any one of us. So I wanted to tell you the story about how I discovered that it's way bigger than any one of us. In 2002, most of us are old enough to remember that, or maybe we're too old so we don't remember it, um, that um, I got an invitation in, um, I forget how all it went. It was at the end of September, I got an invitation to go in December to Iraq. And in 2002, it was before the invasion. It was while they were still looking for weapons of mass destruction and all this. And the goal of it was to see what was happening in Iraq, to go on a peace delegation. And I had like four days to decide if I could go. And so I talked to my board chair and I was doing state policy in California at the time and Iraq was not on the California policy agenda. So I thought I was going to maybe get out of it because it made me nervous. And and John says to me, oh, you've got to go. Oh, oh dear. Oh, that's unfortunate. Okay. And then um, I talked to my community. Oh, I don't know. They were a little nervous, but it seemed like a good idea. And then I, I went to a woman that I was seeing for spiritual direction and I told her about it. And she said to me, well, Simone, listening to you, you know, that's, that invitation seems to be the fruit of your contemplative practice. Oh, oh dear. Can I give it back? But the fruit of my contemplative practice had led me to know profoundly that all of creation is one body, that we are all connected, and none of us are separate. And that the if the body has a need, and I have an, a possibility of responding, who am I to say no? Now, that's exactly what got me here because David asked me, would I come? And so who am I to say no if I can do it? And I think that's that openness that we're led to, to know that we are all connected. And it was Merton's awareness of that that led him to much of his um, social justice engagement because it was not separate. It was not other. We are one. So my, after that, my prayer led me, and then we had this amazing experience in, in Iraq, and it was a fabulous, and invite me back, and I'll tell you that story sometime. But it was learning that the fruit of the contemplative life leads us sometimes to places we'd rather not go, only to be gifted beyond belief with a richness. And it led me to this prayer that, what part of the body am I? What is my role in the body? And I would urge you to think about what part of the body are you? Because I've had people tell me, oh, you know, Simone, you, you do these amazing things. You're so public. You're so this. You're so that. Well, yeah, that's my part of the body. But you've got your part. But we all need to recognize what part we are. 
See, that that's how I came to know that my part in the body, I'm stomach acid in the body of Christ. My job, my job is to stir up energy, to, you know, metabolize food, give off gas occasionally, but be engaged. But I need you. I need others to take that energy and do something with it. I need to be part of this bigger body because it is that intersection, that back and forth. You know, stomach acid in too much quantity, I mean, that's that's illness. There's a problem. There's medicines for that. But we can't live without it. But that's why I need you to have your parts. And so I urge you to think about what is your part in this one body? What do you do? Where are you called? How do you respond to the needs of our time? How are you present in solidarity? Which means much more than engaging in sporadic acts of generosity. It means thinking and acting in terms of community. What do you do? And I'm sure you all have answers, but you may not have asked yourself that question. So I, because of being stomach acid, I got him. It's part of the reason I got the Presidential Medal of Freedom is because I'm stomach acid. But anyway, that was kind of cool. But the I got invited on a delegation to Panama. And I just got back last night. And I wanted to share with you some of what we saw because I am keenly aware that this one body desperately needs to shift that approach of um, focus on security to a focus on community to a focus that opens ourselves up to the broader reality of the world. Now, praise God, I see some heads nodding. Thank you so much. Thought, oh no, they're gonna think I'm nuts. Um, but what I saw is the consequence of our capitalist system is that it requires two things. It requires the free movement of capital, and we have thousands of treaties for that. And it requires the free movement of labor. But what we don't have is the free movement of labor because it's all defined in terms of fear, security, risk, threat. And we have people in devastated conditions who are moving because they have hope. They have hope, so they move. Some of you may have heard about the Darien jungle, the Darien Gap. Any of you hear about the Darien Gap? Okay, a few. Okay, so I'll set the picture. Panama. Panama's weird. I, the first day I was there, I got there Sunday. Sunday night, the sun's setting. I could have sworn the sun was setting in the east because Panama runs not north-south like you would think it would. It runs east-west. And they've got land and weird places. I mean, it's just so blessedly confusing. But anyway, apart from that, Panama is this narrow uh, country. They call it themselves a choke point. And for thousands of years, millennium, the Darien jungle had protected Panama from the Colombians. Originally, Panama was part of Colombia until the folks wanted to build the canal, and then they forced a coup to get Panama away so that we could own the canal. But uh, apart from that, the Panamanians never liked the Colombians. So there's a lot of animosity, but they kept them apart. Uh, between 19, uh, 2010 and 2020, approximately maybe 70,000 people, 10 years, 70,000 people crossed through the Darien. The Darien is a jungle that's recognized by the United Nations. It is a um, 
one of the most pristine jungles in the world. It has this amazing habitat. The Smithsonian has this huge uh, office that studies this amazing habitat, all of this. And it is the link between Colombia and Panama and the North American continent. It has also become the pathway for people fleeing oppressive, horrible realities. Last year, 248,000 people crossed the Darien. It takes five, uh, it takes an average, we were told, of five days. Teenage boys can do it in three because they just run. They don't care about the heat and the mosquitoes and mud. But the, um, so it's an average of five days. Families traveling usually take eight to 10 days. And last year, 248,000 people crossed the Darien from 70 countries. What's happening is um, people in bad situations are flying to Brazil and coming up, walking up through, because Brazil doesn't have um, visa requirements, and then come up through the, uh, through the Darien. You have to know walking through the jungle is hot, humid, green so dense you can't see the sky, mud so intense it sucks your shoes off. I can attest to that. Um, and the mosquitoes, dangerous animals, snakes, and the river is high. People, 248,000 people crossed that last year. This year, in the first five months, 182,000 have crossed. There are more children and families coming. In April, 8,000 people crossed. In May, 8.5 thousand people crossed. And approximately 20% are kids under 12. We saw the, there is part of the river where if you've got money, you can pay to get into a boat, uh, Piraguas and they come down the river. We saw boats coming down. There's a mother who had been in the jungle for seven days carrying an infant with her and had a toddler and her husband was taking care of the toddler. We saw a family of five, three kids, a mom and dad, and one of the girls had, when they were walking along the river in the mud, she she slipped into the river. He, the dad, leaped in after her and barely got out with the girl. But you could see the terror for both of them. Well, actually, all of them. This young girl was just, I mean, just staring. Her family was, you know how with, with um, trauma that people are eager to tell the story. They need to tell the story. And we were new people to hear the story. And she couldn't say a word. But it was also obvious that it was the dad's idea to come. And the mother was shooting daggers at him for putting the family in such risk because the cartel in Colombia has figured out that it's more lucrative to sell people these package tours to cross the Darien because it's a park, you know, to cross the Darien in order to get up to get to North America. And she didn't want to come. The mother did not want to come, but the dad did. And so they came. I don't know. I'm an old family law attorney, and it made me really worried about the, the condition of that marriage, how they were going to resolve this, this conflict. But what I was seeing in that was the hope of people in desperate situations. 
And we describe it in the US in our luxury, in our establishment. Now I understand not all of you are from the US. Thank your lucky stars. But the challenge is for all of us, for the whole world, is how do we in our wealth meet and do more than occasional acts of generosity and respond with solidarity that holds compassion for a world in such pain. We are called to open ourselves to a suffering world. This suffering calls us to hold the woman who shot the Uber driver in El Paso in our hearts as much as we hold the family of the Uber driver or the family in the Darien or our beloved federal policymakers who are making these terrible policies that cause people to sneak in because they are so desperate. It's not about being dangerous. It's about being hungry. It's about trying to find hope. I believe our contemplative practice is desperately needed now more than ever. Thomas Merton's practice led him to his objection to the war in Vietnam. I believe our practices need to lead us, I would say, to the issue of migration in our time. Now, you may have your other favorite piece. Go there. Trust it. You're given an insight. I'm given one insight. You're given another. It doesn't matter which one, but respond. We are desperate for a response that starts from a place of love and inclusion and not willing to leave anyone out of our care. That is the challenge of this age. We need contemplative practices to know what part of the body we are and then to act accordingly. Because if we act with our part of the body, we will be in harmony. We will be able to welcome people in. We will not be separate and we will not be divided by the craziness that's going on in our nation and our world. We need to be more public in our practice and more willing to speak of it. It was years before I claimed a contemplative practice out loud. It felt arrogant, it felt presumptuous, it felt scary. But what I finally realized is, unless we talk about it, unless we're bold enough to put it out there, we're not gonna be able to be the healing presence that we're called to be now. Our world needs us. And so the challenge is, to not be afraid of what we've been given, to not be afraid of insights or moments of clarity or of what a strange struggle it is to do contemplative prayer. I mean, some mornings I have a, re <laughs> I have a really hard time sitting still on my cushion. I've done it for 40 years. You'd think I'd be used to it, but I really do think this time that the timer stopped. And that ever happened to you all? I'm sure I'm right this time. I'm never right. But it's always a sign that whatever I was skittering around is something I need to open up to. Take a deep breath, Simone. Let it in. Oh, hell. And that is what our world is crying to us for, I believe. We need you. We need you to practice. We need you to share the results of your practice. Maybe not in words, but in compassion. Because unless we have a recovery of compassion in this time, I really worry where we're going. So holding your heart, the compassion of the folks traveling tonight through the Darien, they had big rains two days ago. And that means the river's high and it's easy for people to be swept away. 
everyone we talked to had seen at least one body on their trip through the jungle. This is desperate work they're doing. Holding your hearts, those folks that are trying so hard to find a better life for their families. And holding your heart, those people in DC who are making it more difficult because we fear there may not be enough to go around. There's always enough to go around if we share. It's as simple as that, but sharing can be tough. So to close this part, I want to close with a po one of my poems and it's called Living Waters. It's, uh, it wasn't live, uh, written in relationship to the Darien and to the river, but uh, it fits. Oh, and then I should say, we'll have questions, comments, discussion, blah, blah, okay. Living Waters. Impetuous me favors the passionate tumult of spring river flooding. Sensuous me favors the indolent caress of summer river flowing. Reflective me favors the penetrating seep of autumn river trickling. Even aloof shy me favors the chilled reserve of winter river freezing. But all of me resists evaporation. I resist the sucking, pulling, warm air resting me from known boundaries. I resist drifting unseen to unknown parts. I resist the uncertainty of unformed floating, yearning rather to surround rocks and carve new paths. I resist the ambiguous, foggy drift. But luckily, at times, I am yanked into air there, beholding Earth's anguish, weep, weeping, raining, huddling, perhaps the beginning of an exuberant spring. Thank you very much. We do have some time for questions and a bit of discussion. So as we did earlier today, there will be microphones in the aisles. If you have uh, questions, please raise your hand and we'll get you a microphone. While you're pondering your questions, I'll go ahead and ask the first one to start us off. And that is, um, I, I'm just so compelled by your description of holding in compassion, all these people, some of whom are easy to sympathize with and easy to hold in compassion and others who are difficult to, to hold in compassion, but nevertheless attempting that. At the same time, recognizing that political action sometimes means criticism, denunciation, and sometimes it means trying to defeat your opponent. And so I wonder how you think about holding those parts of being engaged in the process of social change alongside holding your adversaries in compassion? Well, it sort of depends what part of the body you are or what part of the body you're going to be at that time. Um, I mean, the nice thing about being <laughs> stomach acid is all food looks good. So that, I mean, you know, Paul Ryan, and I'm sure he didn't think I was digesting him, but it was... It was an opportunity. Now, so if you know what body part you are, then you know where what constructive piece you can do in that setting. There is competition and there is, um, I mean, the benefit of a democracy is a, we attempt to have some civilized discussion and then make choices. So in the choosing, there's a difference. 
So it's uh, some of you do education, educating young people about cho making choices, educating your family, making, I mean, there's all kinds of things about choice. But the thing that I discuss, okay. So, all right, I, I wasn't gonna say, I'll say this. So before the bus, the first bus trip in 2012, I was on a, a Zen retreat for, I was in practice. That's my practice. And I was on a Zen retreat. He sit at the wall and look at the wall for hours and hours. It's ridiculous. Um, but it's the biggest gift of my life. But the um, on that retreat, <laughs> the retreat leader, the Pat, he pushed me. I really value spiritual drift more than spiritual direction. But anyway, he, he pushed me to deal with um, first radical acceptance, which I talked about. The other part I didn't talk about was after I got to radical acceptance, I'd accepted Mitch McConnell. I felt so holy. And so I, 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 I go to Pat and I say, oh, this is, you know, great. And then Pat says, good. I had four more days of retreat. I thought I could be holy for four more days. And he says, now add in fighting. Fighting? What the heck do you mean by fighting? And in the Zen tradition, it, when the teacher rings the bell, it means you leave. So I'm sputtering and he rings the bell and I had to leave and go look at the wall. <laughs> well, what I finally came to realize was the mistake we make about fighting which goes to your question, is that too often we fight against. And when we fight against, we get stuck because we're pushing back. You know, we talk about pushing back against something. We push back and they push back and then we push back. We're stuck in the push back. And rather than fighting against, I realized we are called to fight for a vision so that then my advocacy became trying to I, define the problem together and look at where we want to go. So it fights for a vision and try to get as many people as possible <laughs> facing the same direction. Now, some people just can't get there, but it's not about fighting the other. It's about fighting for a vision. Can you see how liberating that is to not fight against? And so that's the, the beauty of the bus became, oh, okay, because this is a contemplative crowd. I don't usually tell people this part, but when you put radical acceptance together with fighting for a vision, it's fire. It is fire. And I can't, oh, now you're really going to think I'm nuts. But anyway, my uh, uh, realization was that I believe we're each called to be a burning bush. We are each called to let the divine flame up in our lives. And the world is hungry, desperately hungry for that flaming up. I don't experience fire that often, but when I do, I love it. So you have to be careful not to be a glutton, not to demand it all the time, but to let radical acceptance and fighting for a vision be who we're called to be. Don't you think our world could be better if we all did that? Hmm. Hmm. New political party. All right. Oh, no, no, don't say that. Don't say that. That'll get me off in politics. Okay. Don Dominic? Dominic down here. Okay. Now, I told David I would do that. I would do the hard part. Questions. I know I have a bunch of teachers in the room. So questions are those little things that have a little squiggle <laughs> at the end. Uh, the little statement. And if I don't hear a squiggle, I'm going to call it out. Okay, fair enough. Okay, just soon. Uh, thank you for your wonderful, inspirational talk. Uh, I felt that that is the right thing that I needed right now oh, in this yeah. moment. Um, I just want to bring a concrete example or ask how to deal with unearned privilege. You have the possibility to go to Panama and back. These people don't have it. Uh, I sometimes in my academic work support Polish students to come to German conferences and pay for it. And is this just an act of generosity or is that a good way of dealing with 
unearned privilege that I have working in Germany. I, I really think that's one of the big challenges for being so wealthy, having so much unearned privilege, especially in, well, okay, I don't know the German reality, but I'm guessing it's somewhat similar. The, the unearned privilege that I'm keenly aware of that I hold is being in the US is being white. And the fact I don't get followed in a store because they fear I'm going to, you know, shoplift or something like that. But I can't undo my whiteness. What I can do is be aware of it, acknowledge it, and then find ways to try to share privilege as much as possible. Or to use my privilege to benefit others, which is what you're talking about, about supporting someone to come and that kind of thing. No, no. And it's hard to know. Is it generosity? Because I, you know, I just want to feel good about doing it. Or am I actually sharing of my privilege to create a movement? So the question for me would be, do I keep contact? Do I support in new ways? Do I uh, cross, do I visit in Poland? Do I support what they then end up doing as a result? Can I give it publicity? Those kinds of things. Is it is it a two-way street? Do I learn? I, I mean, that's the sacredness of the, this trip to um, when it was post-COVID and I hadn't I'd run out of stories. Everybody would have heard all my old stories. Now I've got a whole bunch of new ones. So I'm sort of greedy that way. But I'm using my privilege to gather stories. But the thing that I realized was COVID had lessened, had weakened my heart of compassion because I was not in proximity. And I, I think that's an untold, unexplored consequence of what we've been through so anything that gets us to rub elbows to be to touch you know i think is important good question though and, and it's an examination of conscience all the time i feel good that i did this yeah is that a good thing <laughs> good question comments Woo okay down here i don't know who's got the Microfono. Un problema es todavía estoy en español. Entonces, es un problema grande. Hi, thank you for your presentation. And you may have just started hinting at this, but I was thinking when you're talking about like working with Paul Ryan and the compassion, are there times when you struggle between being authentically compassionate and being strategically compassionate? Like you've seen the results of compassion. There's a difference. <laughs> but but what do you do in that moment? Because if we're really talking about compassion as this change agent, can it be a change agent if it's not authentic? And so how do you see a correlation between the the practice that you're either having great, great contemplative practice at the time, you're able to be more authentically compassionate? Like, how do you how do you deal with that? Because I can imagine some of these not people think about it. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I think the I mean, that's interesting. I am extremely strategic. Um, I might use it strategically. Now, I might use it strategically. But what could be wrong with being compassionate? Even if we, <laughs> okay, can I tell you one story? So in 2013, we did Nuns on the Bus was on immigration. We were trying to support the Senate. We got, we ended up helping get the immigration bill out of the Senate, but then John Boehner wouldn't bring it up in the House, so we lost it again. But when it started up by uh, uh, Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty, and then we came down, and we were in, did a rally in D.C., and we'd invited President Obama, and he was busy being president, so he couldn't come. But he, the, his staff invited me down to the, the White House and to meet with the president. Well, I thought there were going to be other people there. It was me and the president in the Oval Office for 15 minutes by myself. I was a little nervous, but I we, I had brought this uh, tablet that had pictures from our first stops, and it had our map 
which showed us going down the East Coast across the South and up to Angel Island in California, which is the equivalent of Ellis Island, but for the Asian immigrants. And um, we were supporting the Gang of Eight. We were supporting all the Republicans that were in favor of it and trying to get other Republicans to sign on Senate. And <laughs> President Obama looks at me and he goes, hmm, I believe that evidence is some strategery on your part. <laughs> The good George Bushisms. He he loved doing George Bush imitations. But anyway, I don't know if he still does. But but I think the the strategery of it. That's how I got off on that story. Does it really matter if it's strategic or not, as long as it's compassion? It's a question I'm asking myself because I, I sense that yeah, there is something that matters, but I don't know what that is. I don't know. That's why I, have to ask. I think it would be very hard to pretend compassion, praise God, I don't have to lobby right now, against a couple of the women representatives in the House right now. Um, the current speaker I have compassion for because he's really not that bright. May not be the right reason, but I, I knew him in California politics. So I, when I did state advocacy, I knew him from there. So it's a different relationship. So I know Bakersfield. I know where he comes from. I know how much he wanted that job and how compromised he is to get what his heart desired. And it's like, oh, puppy. Oh. Um, so that's more authentic uh, for me. I certainly don't agree with him. Um, I don't know. I'll have to think about it. I, I also, as okay, confessions of a guilty bystander, but um, I don't know if in myself I can separate strategic from compassion. I just breathe strategy. And what I, I was surprised to discover in DC that not that many people do. It's interesting. They've got other other gifts. You just have to figure out which one it is. But strategery is mine. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Yes, in the back. Somebody's got a microphone in the back. And can I ask you to remove your mask for just saying this part? So you talk about your compassion, like the activeness of it being in conversation with Paul Ryan, for example, how do you see compassion being enacted for those of us who either conversations are rejected or don't have the opportunity if we want to have like compassion for like people in Washington and we don't interact with them? Like, how do you see us actively having compassion without having the opportunity to actively practice compassion in those ways? We all have family to talk to. And quite frankly, holding, for me, holding, I, I don't do that much lobbying nowadays. I'm about to on this immigration thing because it set my hair on fire, what I saw. So I said she in a very thoughtful, contemplative fashion. Her hair was on fire. But anyway, um, but to hold compassion for those people. I, I'll confess that right now, Donald Trump does not, I do not have compassion for Donald Trump. I, I've got to find a way to do it. Um, but what I've come to realize is for me, the inroad to compassion is seeing the human being. And the cover is so intense for him, for Trump. He's like one of those Russian dolls, you know, so protected, it's very hard to see any the the real truth to feel like you're connected. So if I hold compassion for some of the other actors, then it is in relation that then when I'm in relationship with my fraught conversations with beloved family members, then I come at it differently 
than if I'm ready for the fight. And I have to know which mood I'm in. And, and for Thanksgiving, it's really important I get in the better space, you know? But, but it's, it's that how I feel about the other affects how I feel about the people in front of me. And then also knowing when I need to walk away. Oh, one story, um, like I never told any other stories. Um, in 2016, we took the bus to um, uh, the two conventions. We were in Cleveland at the Republican convention and in Philadelphia at the Democratic convention. And I love the bus, so much fun. We did lemonade ministry where we had these red wagons and we had big coolers of lemonade and we poured little lemonade cups and then asked delegates waiting to go in to, through the security if they had to answer questions. And we had three questions. Uh, we asked the same questions at both, both conventions and then compared notes. The first question was, who in your family is it difficult to talk to about politics and why? And we expected the Republicans to say the Democrats and Democrats say Republicans. For the most part, that was the case. The second question was, what worries you in this election cycle? Well, that surprised us because at both conventions, uh, the, the most common answer was the, that they were worried about their candidate. That was both in the Dems and the Republicans. And the third was the corker, because we wanted to end on a high note. And um, so it was, what gives you hope for our nation? <laughs> oh, at the Republican convention, it was so sad because so many of them were like, hope. Um, Um, uh, uh, mm, hope. Uh, they had trouble coming up with hope at the Democratic convention was, oh, this and that, and this and that. And they had all kinds of ideas. But this one woman at the Republican convention, I'll never forget, from Texas, big blonde hair, stiletto heels, the sequin vest, quite buxom, and sequins with red, white, and blue, and stars, and I mean, she was decked out. It's a hope for our nation. What gives me hope for our nation is that Donald J. Trump is going to be elected president of the United States and restore the masculinity of men in our nation that have been kneecapped by the feminist movement. Kneecap. <laughs> I've been puzzling about that ever since. But but the thing is, is she was so passionate, so sincere, so different. So I came away puzzled, but trying to take what she said as her point of view. Luckily, I don't have to engage it, but to know it's out there, it's important. I don't know, it probably could be a lot better. Mm. Yeah, one more quick question, and then, then I've got to end with a, a thing. Okay, so I've been dying to ask you a question all night and coming down here, because I guess it's hard to see me with the light. Oh, um, thanks. I just want to say thank you. I was so encouraged by your talk today and you are just achieving so many things that I kind of want for myself. So oh, cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool listening to you. But for my question today, this is maybe going to betray my naivety or youth or both. But when you ask everyone about. No, no, their... no, no, no. Don't worry. Don't worry. Your beautiful long hair and your youthful youth. demeanor kind of betrays that. Well, I was trying to mask it for tonight, but I guess I failed. Um, when you asked the question about how many of us have integrated contemplative practices, I won't lie, I was in the minority that kept my hand down. And I feel oftentimes that I am up to my eyeballs reading philosophers and theologians and everyone else who are so contemplative and it's beautiful and I romanticize it and I want it. But practically, where does that begin? Because it feels like for me at this juncture in life that 
I wake up in the morning and I pick up my phone and I have the entire world telling me across six different platforms that like the world is on fire. There's kids dying. There's people who can't get into a country who are trying to save their families. And we have people looking away in greed and in capitalism and in all sorts of other things. And then they say, and it's you, you're the face, you're now, fix it, fix it. And it is both entirely exhilarating to feel like I could be a piece of a solution and completely devastating to try and take it all on at once. Amen. And the idea of stepping away in contemplation from either extreme feels unbearable. There it is. There it is. It's not stepping away. It's stepping into. It's opening your heart in a different way. Six minutes, five minutes. Don't look at your... 90 seconds. Did I hear that? Okay. So the... To start with, okay, now, okay, Robert will like this. I have some directions in my book. Oh. <laughs> but the, but for, you don't need to do it live. It's about opening your heart before you look at your phone. It's about letting your sides down. I, I experience it as letting my sides down so that I don't have to hold it tight and it's all up to me. No, I'm part of one body. Let yourself know that you're part of one body. And then the question becomes, what's my part in this painful reality? There's the question you sit with for a while. And eventually something bubbles up. May answer the question, may not, but whatever it is, is treasure. But it only, I mean, it starts, starts small. When I practice law, okay, this is confession of, again, um, I, I would do 15 minutes before I went to the office. But I had so many urgent things to do. What was it? <laughs> so I, I would make these, I would do these silly games with myself. I can't do 15 minutes today. I'll do 12. What was three minutes difference? I have no idea, but that was the game I played to get myself to do it because I had a busy day ahead. And so whatever it is that gets you able to just open yourself to mystery beyond ourselves, try it. It's easy. 12 minutes. It's worth it. <laughs> All right. You can do it. Si se puede. Si se puede. Si se puede. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I have I have one announcement. I, I'm going to be here tomorrow because I'm eager to do some of the workshop. Actually, I wish I could bilocate, but I can't. Um, but the um, I'm doing a project this summer um, with our program. I, I've got this new program, Understanding Us, that I'm doing with these two guys where it's about democracy. What I'm going to do, I used to be a nun on the bus, now I'm going to be a nun in the car, and I'm going to drive through the South, going to independent bookstores, inviting conversations with people who think differently. And it really comes out of my contemplative practice that I've got to do something about democracy. And I've got a capacity to ask questions and to tell jokes and I mean, tell stories that make people laugh and that brings people together. And so trying to hear how people see things differently. And then what I'm going to do is the idea is from the road is some, send some electronic postcards. So, um, you know, like with picture of the bookstore where we were and, you know, to send a post, a little note about what happened. Would you believe what happened in Cookville, Tennessee? Any, it, those kinds of things. So if you're interested, you want to be on the list. There's two ways to get on the list. One is <laughs> the less efficient way is to give me your email address, <laughs> legibly printed. And, um, or the other piece is to go on our web website, um, which is letsunderstand.us, letsunderstand.us, and just sign up. And I'm going to use all the folks that have signed up as the, the recipients of our, of our, um, uh, postcards from the road it could be interesting who knows but but this is another case where the contemplative i had to do something and this is what came 
It's gift. It's gift. So, all right. So I wanted to close with a poem. Oops, wrong one. Um, where'd it go? And some of you have heard this one because it's one of, it's one of my favorites. It's, it's one of my poems, but it, it goes with, where'd she go? Where's my young one? Uh, right there. Okay. This, this, this connects with what you connects with what you were asking. Okay. At least for me, it does. Hopefully it does for you. And um, it's called loaves and fish. Some of you've heard it. And uh, everybody knows the story about how the people followed Jesus out to the desert and Peter's getting nervous because they're getting hungry and they're going to get grumpy. And so he um, says to Jesus, send them back to town. They're going to get grumpy. And Jesus says to him, feed them yourselves. Uh oh. And G Peter says, well, all we've got are a couple of day old loaves of bread and a couple of stinky fish. I mean, what's that among all these people? And Jesus, you could just see him go. Ugh. And so Jesus has everybody sit down in groups of 50. I'm putting all the stories together, but in, in groups of 50, ever the community organizer. And he blesses, blesses it, breaks it, and the apostles give it out. And Matthew's gospel, Matthew 14, says 5,000 men were fed to say nothing of the women and children. Well, I didn't like that line, nothing of the women and children. What are we? So, okay, you've, got, you've already discovered I have this odd prayer life. So I prayed about it. What does this mean? And what I came to was Matthew only counted the ones who thought it was a miracle. The women knew they bought snacks from home. Whoa, what a miracle. Oh, doesn't that happen at Thanksgiving? Oh, look at all this. Whoa, what a miracle. Okay, so this is the poem about loaves and fish. I always joked that the miracle of loaves and fish was sharing. The women always knew this. But in this moment of need and notoriety, I ache, tremble, almost weep at folks so hungry, malnourished, faced with spiritual famine of epic proportions. My heart aches with their need. Apostle-like, I whine. What are we among so many? The consistent 2,000-year-old ever-new response is this. Blessed and broken, you are enough. I savor the blessed, cower at the broken, and pray to be enough. Thank you. Let me express as we close the gratitude of this entire community, Sister Simone, for your generosity in being here with us, for the witness of your work and your life uh, over many, many years of, of bringing compassion, bringing contemplation into public life. And thank you for the challenge that you've offered to us here to do the same. We're grateful for your presence. As we prepare to make our way out of here, let me just say a couple of things. One is that, as Simone mentioned, she says she will be around tomorrow morning. So if you're interested in talking with her, buying a book and asking her to sign it, for instance, you can do that tomorrow morning. If you're able to catch her tonight, fine, but she'll be around tomorrow as well. So, um, so you'll have an opportunity to make those connections um, uh, then. Tonight, it is 844, it looks like, and I've been told that the golf carts will be ready to shuttle people from here back to the residence halls between 845 and nine o'clock. So if you are relying on a golf cart, you should make your way out of here relatively quickly in order to find one of those to get back to your residence hall. Otherwise, you're welcome to linger for a few minutes and chat, um, but make sure you get nice rest tonight. We've got another full day tomorrow. I look forward to it. Thank you very much.